In the last hour, we showed that when you add two random variables x and y to form another random variable z, we obtain the PMF or the PDF respectively in the case where uh, x and y are discrete and in the case where x and y are continuous of this new random variable z by convolving the PMFs or the PDFs of the random variables x and y. Okay, so z is x, y, is x plus y, x and y are independent and continuous, then we have that fz of z equals fx of z convolved by fy of z. Now let's use this in a very important example. Here's the example. <coughs> X, uh, I thought I got black, so let me get black. X and Y are both uniform. Uh, uniform in the interval 0 to 1. I don't believe that. There is no black, so we'll have to continue with the blue. Okay. <clears throat> X is, um, or let's just say X1 and X2 are uniform in 0 to 1. Okay. So fx1 of x looks like this and fx2 of x also looks like that. Okay. And we need the convolution so fz of z is fx1 of z convolved by fx2 of z because z is defined as, or let, let's call this z1. z1 is defined as the sum of x1 and x2. Let's do this convolution together. Okay. What are we doing? fz1 of z is the integral minus infinity to infinity um, fx1 of x, fx2 of z minus x, dx. Okay? All we need to do is determine the limits of integration, essentially, because the functions are extremely simple. Now, fx1 of x looks like this. It's just flat from 0 to 1. fx2 of z minus x on the other hand, what does it look like? fx2 of minus x is simply the flipped version of fx2 of x. So this would be fx2 of negative x, right? Right. fx2 of negative x is simply um, the flipped version of fx2 of x. Now, fx2 of z minus x, what is that? The flipped version shifted by z. If z is positive, it's this shifted to the right. If z is negative, it's shifted to the left. <coughs> okay? So, for example, um, consider f z minus x, where z is negative. It's going to look like this. Okay? z is less than 0. What is this point? This point is z, and this point is z minus 1. Why? Because the whole support 
of the function is 1. I flipped it. <coughs> so basically, I took this, I flipped it, and I shifted it by z. Okay? So this end point is at z, the other end point at z minus 1. Okay. Now, so we understand from this picture that when z is negative, the product of these functions is zero everywhere, right? So this integral is equal to zero whenever z is less than zero. Any problem? When z is negative, this integral is zero because the two functions don't overlap. Now let's think about the positive value of z. Let me draw it uh, separately here. Um, this is my fx1 of z, fx1 of x, sorry. And my fx2 is now looking like this. z is here, z minus 1 is here. The range of z for this picture is between 0 and 1. OK? Now, if z is between 0 and 1, there is some overlap between the two functions. And the integral is the area of this shaded region. That is equal to what? z times 1, right? Which is z. Okay, it's z whenever z is between 0 and 1, if you want. Let's make this inclusive. doesn't matter if you put the uh, less than or equal to here or here because it's a continuous function. <clears throat> What's the next region? The next region is when z gets bigger than 1, so the second square moves out of the first square. This is, again, this is um, the case where z is between 1 and 2. Okay, when z is between 1 and 2, the overlap is this region. <clears throat> it is the integral from z minus 1 to 1 of 1 dx. <clears throat> And it gives me what? 1 minus z. Provided z is between 1 and 2. Okay? And when z is bigger than 2, what happens? Again, we get 0. So when z is less than 0 or z is bigger than 2, I get 0. Okay, so let's, let me plot this. Great, I found my black marker. So, <laughs> just in time. Okay, so um, let me try to make this straight. Um, Fz of z, as a function of z, looks like a triangle. Okay, so from 0 to 1, it increases with a slope of 1. And from 1 to 2, again, it decreases with a slope of 1. Looks like a tent. What happened as a result of the con uh, convolution? Let's inspect this a little bit. The original functions both had a support of 1. When we convolved them, the support of the resulting function has increased to 2. which makes sense because when you add x and y, the range of values are increased it's anywhere from 0 to 2. So this is expected. I guess you didn't follow. Huh? Which part? This. This. This is when, um, this is the case where 
the second function sliding over the first function. This is its position when z is between 0 and 1. This is its position. This is its position where when z is between 1 and 2. This is fx2 of um, z minus x when z is between 1 and 2. Okay? And this, this position is always equal to z. This position is e always equal to 1 minus z. Okay? To, to be economic on the board, I use the same figure for two positions. Yes, please. Well, okay, uh, actually, the answer was right there looking at you on the board, I believe, in the last hour, which is the total probability theorem in this context, okay? So what are we doing? Remember discrete case. The probability that x plus y equals k. Okay. Now, x I know, x takes values in a certain range, y takes values in another range. I have their PMFs. Okay. Now, I want to compute this thing. And this is found by conditioning over um, on one of them. Uh, so I, 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 I can write this as Py of k minus L times Px of L, summed over all L. So now every value of L has a weight. Okay? That corresponds to something. Um, that, that combined by, with this value of Y, which is k minus L, would give me a result k. So what I'm doing is I'm adding all possible ways in which I can get k. So um, there are infinite possibilities <coughs> for, for, for this value of L. Given L, I have um, uh, this is what y has to be. Okay, k minus L. Now I do that for every L. That corresponds to taking one function uh, and for every value of, um, basically, taking one function and sliding it over the other function. So it, it comes out, so in, if, if this was in the context of systems theory, okay, we would make another explanation. Why, where does it come up in systems theory? It comes up in the impulse response, for example. It's really unrelated to our class right now, but let's spend a minute on that. I know, for example, the response of a system to one impulse. Now you give me two different impulses placed at different points. What would I do? I would, because of linearity and time invariance, I would sum the response to the first impulse and suppose that's at zero. The other impulse is at uh, delayed. So I would delay my impulse response and sum it with the other impulse response. That would give me the response to the input. Now I can express the input, um, any input, as um, any input as a sum or uh, integral of uh, you know using impulses, delta functions. Okay. That allows me to express any output in terms of a convolution of the input signal with the system impulse function. So convolution is a different kind of um, I would say, well, it's a new operation. Um, 
using functions that uh, is very related to um, this idea of um, total probability theorem in probability and the idea of impulse response in systems um, and, and so on. Okay? So anyway, after this digression, what I'd like to do is add another independent random variable. So let's say Z3 is X, um, or, or not, let's not say this. Let me erase this. This is because this is general. X1, X2, X3 is a sequence of functions, I'm sorry, a sequence of random variables that are all independent of each other and they're all uniform in 0 to 1. So they have this identical PDF. And I would like to form Zn by summing x1 up to xn. Now, first of all, I'd like to consider Z3, which is x1 plus x2 plus x3. But notice that Z3 is nothing but Z2 plus X3. I'm sorry. Z3 is nothing but this Z1. Um, maybe the notation is a little off. Um, so let, let, me, let me call this Z2. How about that? So Z, um, Zn minus 1 is, is X1 plus X2 plus uh, all the way up to Xn for n bigger than or equal to 2. Hmm? Okay. So, now, Z2 is Z1 plus X3. Okay? I already have computed the PDF FZ1 of Z. Right? I already know this. It's here. It's a triangle function. And I know the PDF of X3 that I know. This is known. Fx3 of X is known. And I know that this is independent of this. Why? Because this is a combination of X1 and X2, and X1 and X2 are both independent of X3. So these two are independent. So all I have to do to find Fz2 is to convolve these two functions. Any question? No? Okay. So Fz2 of z is Fz1 of z convolved by Fx3 of uh, z, which is the integral from minus infinity to infinity, f z, um, well, f, if you want, f uh, z1 of um, x, f x3 of z minus x dx. What does this mean? This means keep z1, f z1 fixed, flip and shift f x3. Okay? the value of the shift is exactly equal to z. So for every z, we'll compute the area in the overlap of the two functions. So there are four or five cases I'd like uh, you to focus because I'm going to draw all the, sketch all the cases on this figure itself. Okay? So case one. So basically, I'm, um, let me rewrite this as a function of x because x is my running variable in the integration. fz1 of x. I have xz1 of x here. Now I need fx3 of z minus x. fx3 of z minus x looks like this. Let me use another color. It looks like this. It's not even, 
working. When, when does it look like this? This point is equal to z, this point is z minus 1. So it looks like this when z is less than 0. Any problem? So when z is less than 0, the two functions have no overlap, the integral is 0. Now it starts overlapping when z becomes positive. And it looks like this when z is between 0 and 1. So I'm going to say f z2 of z is equal to 0 when z is negative. And it's the integral from 0 to z. 0 to z of z, oh, I'm sorry, of x, dx, okay, which is equal to what? <coughs> z squared over 2 when z is between 0 and 1. Okay? <coughs> yes, please. When the two functions have no overlap, when you multiply them, you get zero everywhere. Right? That's why. <clears throat> so when the functions overlap like this, when you multiply, you get zero everywhere except this region. <clears throat> now, what is the second region? Second region is when it, z crosses this boundary, which is at 1. So when z exceeds 1, the two functions start looking like this. There are two regions in the integration, from z minus 1 to 1 and from 1 to z. Okay, are you focusing? Okay. From z minus 1 to 1, x dx, and from 1 to z, what is the function here? 1 minus x? No, 2 minus x. 2 minus x. 2 minus x dx. Okay? What is that going to come out to be? That's going to come out to be the following. Let me just write it down. It's equal to 3z minus z cubed minus 3 over 2. Okay. And uh, that is true whenever z is between 1 and, and 2. Okay. Let's verify that this and this meet at the endpoints. At z equals 1, this gives us 1 half. At z equals 1, this function gives us 3 minus 1, there's 2 minus 3 over 2, again 1 half. So they meet, which is nice. Okay, finally, um, what is the next region? Next region is when the overlap is only in this, this part, um, and the integral goes from z minus 1 to 2, and we have 2 minus x, the x, and that evaluates as, evaluates as z squared over 2 minus 3z plus 9 over 2. And that is valid when z is, what, between 2 and until it completely goes out, which is that which corresponds to 3. And after 3, again, the integral is 0. So when z is bigger than or equal to 3, 
we have Fc2 being equal to 0. Let's sketch, yes, please. Of course. So we have to do this integration. I mean, the basic challenge in convolution is determining the regions uh, where the limits of integration change. Okay. So in this case, there are um, two, three, four, five, five different regions okay, in this example. Okay, so you fix one of those functions, flip and shift the other function, and then you determine the regions uh, where the limits of integration change. Okay, anyway, let's um, let's plot this and see what it looks like. Excuse me. Okay. So let me try to sketch f z2 of z. Hmm. It starts where? Starts at 0. Let's say this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4. Now what do we expect its support to be? The support is of this random variable. It's constructed by adding x1 and x2 and x3. It it can take values as large as 3 and as small as 0, and it's continuous. So we expect its slope, I'm sorry, we expect its support to be 3. From 0 to 1, it increases like a quadratic, like a parabola. From 1 to 2, it becomes a third order polynomial. And if you plot it, you'll see that it looks like this. In fact, it's going to make its peak somewhere around 1.5, exactly at 1.5. So I should draw this so it's going to turn around after 1.5. And at 2, at 2, it becomes, it goes into the third region, becomes a quadratic again. <coughs> and at 3, at the point 3, at the value 3, it goes back to 0. Excuse me? As you can see, these two tails are both quadratic. They are, in fact, exactly symmetric. Okay, I try to make it look as symmetric as I can. Does it remind you of something? A Gaussian, right? It already starts looking like a Gaussian. Now, in fact, if you, <clears throat> if we were to convolve one more square function, one more uniform PDF with this, we would see that fz3 of z would be, wait a second, fz3 of z would have a support of 4, making a peak at 2, and it would look even more smooth and even more um, resemble a Gaussian even more. The value at this peak, what is it? Let's look at our computation. Um, we need to plug in 1.5 here. Okay, and you can obtain the peak. Okay? Now, in fact, you can show that as n goes, as n as n grows, okay, Zn uh, becomes, you know, F, Fzn of Z becomes Gaussian. Okay? 
what is the expectation of Zn? <clears throat> so the expected value of, or let's say expected value of Zn minus 1, because Zn minus 1 is the sum of x1 through xn, it's the expectation of the sum, which is the sum of the expectations. It's n over 2, right? What is the variance? Variance of Zn minus 1. Again, the random variables are independent, so the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. The variance of each of these things which are uniform from 0 to 1 is 1 over 12. So we have n over 12. So if we normalize Zn <coughs> minus 2, um, if we consider um, Z tilde n as uh, Zn minus 2 minus its mean, which is n over 2, divided by the square root of the variance, Okay, the normalized Zn minus 2. The limit, as n goes to infinity, of F Zn tilde of Z is the Gaussian, standard Gaussian density. Okay. And that is the central limit theorem, essentially. We will formally visit it later. Right now, we're not proving it. We haven't done anything to prove it. But we only gave a hint okay, that when you add a lot of independent random variables, the sum starts looking more and more like a Gaussian. Okay, so what's next? Let's wake up our computer once again. Um, I don't know. Yes, of course. Very nice. Okay. So, what's next? Let's see. The next topic is covariance and correlation. Um, so here I said something, uh, sort of, which sort of reminds you something about independent and uncorrelated or uncorrelated random variables. I said the variance of the sum of independent random variables is the sum of the variances. And we know that this is not always true. It's true in the case of independence, independent random variables, but it's not Independence is not necessary for what I said to hold. What is necessary for what I said to hold is uncorrelatedness. So this is the point in our class where we formally define uncorrelatedness. And in fact, um, formally define the concept of uh, covariance and correlation. The covariance of two random variables x and y is the expectation of x minus the mean of x times y minus the mean of y. It's a quantitative measure of the relationship between the two random variables. The magnitude of the covariance reflects the strength of the relationship between x and y. The sign conveys the direction of the relationship. When the covariance of x and y is zero, the two random variables are said to be uncorrelated. When the correlation is positive, roughly speaking, they tend to increase or decrease together. When the covariance is negative, it implies that when x increases, y tends to decrease and vice versa. When y increases, x decrease, tends to decrease. Okay. So show, let's show that the covariance of x and y uh, is alternatively found as the expectation of the product 
minus expected x, expected y. This is a trivial exercise that we essentially did before in class, so I'd like you to work this out yourself. Okay? Now, it follows from this definition, from this expression, that when x and y are independent, they are also uncorrelated, because when x and y are independent, expectation of the product is equal to the product of the expectation, so this comes out as zero, the covariance is zero, and the random variables are independent. Um, but uncorrelatedness doesn't imply independence, and here's our canonical example that we used before, actually, both in the discrete and the continuous case. Let's assume the continuous case right now. Suppose um, the joint PDF of X and Y are um, uniform, is uniform in this region that looks like a rhombus, symmetric around the origin. Are X and Y independent? So FXY, XY, let's call this region A, um, is equal to a constant when X and Y belong to the region A and it's zero otherwise. Are X and Y are independent? No. Why not? Why, why not? Well, um, one easy way to argue is that, for example, when um, X takes the value zero, Y varies between negative one and one. On the other hand, when X takes the value one, Y has to be zero. So the value of X influences the range of values that Y can take. Okay, X and Y are not independent, but clearly the expectation of the product is zero, which is equal to the expected value of X times the expected value of Y, because by symmetry the expectation of X is zero, and the expectation of Y is also zero. So this is an example showing that two random variables that are uncorrelated are not necessarily independent. What's next? Okay, the correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient rho of xy is defined as covariance of x and y divided by the square root of the product of variances of x and y. Okay? So what is the um, value of the correlation coefficient of a random variable with itself? Rho xx. Covariance. Covariance of x with itself is, remember, what is the definition of covariance? It's the expectation of x minus expected value of x times y times expectation of y. But y is in this case the same as x, so we have the covariance being equal to the variance. Covariance of x and x is nothing but the variance of x. Okay, so we already know this. So basically the covariance is an extension of the de um, definition of variance to more than one random variable. Okay, so rho xx, rho xx, which is the covariance of x and x divided by the square root of variance of x, variance of x, is 1. In fact, rho xy for two random variables x and y always lives between negative 1 and 1. And it takes these extreme values, negative 1 and 1, only when x and y are linearly dependent. What do I mean? Rho xy is equal to plus or minus 1 if and only if, very strong statement, 
y is equal to a constant times x. Let's actually compute rho xy when y is equal to a constant times x. <clears throat> now, remember that the covariance of x and y is, let's go back, is expected xy minus expected x expected y. So the covariance is expected x times ax minus expected x expected ax. Okay? So this is a times expected value of x squared minus a times expected x squared. What is this? What you see here? You see a times the variance of x. So let's compute rho xy. That's the covariance of x and y divided by the square root of the variances multiplied. Here we have a times the variance of x and in the denominator we have so, um, the square root of variance of x multiplied by the variance of a times x. The variance of a times x is a squared times variance of x. So when you divide these, since variance is positive, this term cancels the product of the square root of the product of the variances. Um, so we have a over the absolute value of a. Okay, what does this mean? This is either 1 or minus 1. This is 1 when a is um, positive and negative 1 when a is negative. So basically, if y is equal to a times x, when a is pos a positive constant, x and y are very positively correlated x increases, y increases too. When a is negative, they are very negatively correlated. And those are the two extreme cases for correlatedness. Okay? Um, all right. Any questions? The next thing is to show that, and we come to the beginning of this lecture, where we're talking about the variance of the sum of two random variables. Variance of x plus y. In general, when x and y are not necessarily independent. This I would like you to show is equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y plus twice the covariance of x and y. How would we show this? Basically, uh, it's a very easy derivation starting, um, okay, let me do a couple steps. The variance of x plus y. It is the expectation of x plus y uh, minus expected x plus y squared. Okay? So it is the expectation of x squared plus 2xy plus y squared minus expected value of x squared minus expected value of y squared minus two expected x, expected y. So this expression you can write as um, the variance, if you collect the terms, you get the variance of x plus the variance of y plus twice expected xy 
minus expected x, expected y, which is the covariance of x and y. Okay? So that's great. We now know a general result for the sum, variance of the sum. Okay? Previously, we only knew that the variance of x plus y is equal to the sum of the variances when they are independent. In general, when they are not independent, we need to add twice the covariance. When they are independent, they are uncorrelated, so the covariance is zero. And we are back to the original independence result. Okay? We will use this next time to do um, a nice example, remember the hat problem where n people switch their, shuffle their hats and we are interested in the number of people who randomly get their own hats back. We computed the expected people of getting their own hat back as one. We'll now compute the variance of that and the variance will also come out to be one. Okay, so um, I recommend you work on that on your own. I'll see you next time.